you don't need a bus like this. You don't need any of this. I built this, but like no one else really should. So this is my overbuilt roof rack. It's one of the key things that makes it a do all the things Gordo wants to do bus. And it's funny, the kind of stuff you get asked to do when all of a sudden you've got a crane. I ended up building the door system, the presence that they have in terms of making it feel like you're in a sci-fi movie set. Yeah, this won't be perfect, but it'll be better than nothing. What it turned into is so above and beyond what I had hoped it would be. I guess the tent poles of this bus are flexibility and sort of like an adventure platform, let's call it. At the place where I work, the building was designed from the ground up to be really flexible and that's sort of permeated through all the projects that we do. And I think it maybe rubbed off on me a little too much. So when I designed this bus, it was all about like, okay, great, it's gonna have this cargo space, but I don't want it to be just a cargo space. So it's gotta also be useful as a camping space and it's gotta be able to be covered and it's gotta be screen windows and like all these different sort of modes for everything. So the, the original location of the fuel tank on this bus was in the middle of the frame behind the rear axle. And in order to fill it up, it had a tube that came like way up to this level. So I had to get rid of that to make my flatbed and so I moved the fuel tank up to here. So this is the original tank, but just in a new location. And then on the other side, I've added a second tank uh, just for added capacity. Coming off of this tank, I run my diesel generator, my diesel heaters. There's fittings on there to get fuel in and out, like by a fuel pump system to the other tank. Um, so there's just, at this point, so many fittings on that tank. Both tanks are 65 gallons, but they're slightly different shapes. So my total fuel capacity is like 130 gallons, which is, getting pretty expensive these days, but it gives me a lot of range or twice as much range as I used to have anyways. This is the new stairwell that I built. So the door is the stock door and the mechanism of the door is the stock mechanism, but I built a new frame and a new set of stairs to put it in. That's mostly due to the fact that when I did the major like exterior refabrication of the bus, I had a very specific amount of time to do it in. And so I pre-built as many things as I could possibly think of. And one of them was like, well, I'll probably just throw away the old stairwell. So I should build a new stairwell. This is just a big aluminum underbody storage box. I keep garage stuff in here mostly. All my sort of lubricants and some spare oil and funnels and filters and a belt and whatever. I've got a shop vac in here right now. Uh, camp chairs, just sort of the catch-all storage, the junk drawer, if you will. And then this is my battery box. This is here because right inside this wall is where all my Victron system and stuff is, all my distribution. So the, having the batteries right here makes the wiring really simple. And this is two drawers of six batteries each. Um, this has, this is the three starter batteries and then three uh, AGM uh, gel hybrid house batteries. And then this drawer is six more house batteries. I went with gel hybrids because the temperature requirements on this build made me a little uncomfortable going with lithium because this build sits unattended in the winter for long periods of time, unheated, and it needs to be able to continue to charge and discharge its batteries during that time. I didn't really trust lithium to like be able to manage itself during those cold winter months without being able to heat the batteries and using power to heat the batteries and it got complicated. So I just went with gel for now and maybe I'll go lithium in the future. This is the International DT466E and it's a 2003 model year chassis. And this one doesn't have the EPA EGR nonsense. Last model year, as I understand it, that didn't have some of those headache features, we'll call them. And it's been great to me, honestly. The school district that I bought it from had over maintained their whole fleet. They had a huge fleet. They couldn't afford to not maintain their buses. And so I've got detailed records of everything and it's been really good. I haven't had that many problems with it. And then behind the engine is an Allison 2000 transmission, which I, you know, can't complain about at all. To keep me going highway speeds on the highway, get me up steep hills and it's still a bus. It's still slow. It's still huge, but no complaints. I replaced the school bus lights up under the little eyelashes with uh, LED light bars which I hardly ever use really, but I wanted to keep the little eyelash things. I, I feel like that's another thing, kind of like the school bus store that really reminds you it's a school bus, which I think is kind of fun. If I was gonna keep those little eyelash things, I wanted to put lights in them. So I, I just got some uh, LED light bars and been happy with that. The bus is 36 and a half feet long, 
up from when I bought it, it was like 35 feet long or something like that. Everyone assumes that I added all of that flatbed on there, but the bus was almost that full length just as a bus body. And I just cut most of it off. This is the original fuse box door, which is pretty much empty now. This used to be all full of junk and wires having to do with like all the school bus flashing lights and things like that. And this has pretty much been replaced by my own electrical distribution stuff that I've put in. Um, but this like tail lights and brake lights and stuff still go through there. This is my shore power hookup. It's just a 15 amp plug. I don't, haven't really needed to worry about having more capacity than that just because my, I have so many other options. This is my diesel generator in a very fancy sliding box that I made for it. I got this generator off eBay from somebody who pulled it off like a work truck in uh, Las Vegas. And the generator was like $1,800, I wanna say. It was more than that after I shipped it. I think it was almost, almost an even two grand. But because of the ways I use this bus and the types of equipment I wanna be able to run off of it, having a source of power that's not reliant on the sun and can just like provide a full five kilowatts at the flip of a switch, uh, is, is pretty important to me anyways, to be able to run like a welder and a bunch of power tools or an air compressor and things like that and not just kill the battery in a matter of an hour or two. Um, and it was certainly a lot cheaper than, uh, you know, putting a full roof of solar and a full uh, huge bank of lithium batteries only to solve the problem of how do I run my welder. Then this little box is a recent addition because this stuff used to be buried under the frame, but this is my fuel pumps for my diesel heaters. Every so often I have an issue with a diesel heater where like one of them loses their prime or like they get an air bubble in the fuel or something like that. I finally got sick of like crawling under the bus to fix a leak or purge a line or whatever in the middle of the winter. So I moved everything out here to this box. Um, this is a little priming pump. I just, it squirts diesel out this hose and I can catch it in a cup, but that lets me prime the whole line between my tank and here easily. So that was a quality of life mod for myself. Um, and you can tell it's not done because this is still sort of just floating loose here. This is the exhaust from the diesel heater that's right inside. The next box is air system stuff. Because my air door uses or was, you know, stock, it, it ran off the air brake compressors, they'd only, it only recharged when the engine was running. So I sort of built a secondary air system that's these two compressors and these two tanks um, to run the air door and to run to be sort of shop air for, you know, if I need to inflate a tire or use a blow gun or whatever, I have a second source of air. And also it keeps the air door running when I'm parked for a long period of time. It keeps the tank full and everything. And then there's a bunch of open space where I'm gonna put water tanks. And then there's the second diesel tank. Doesn't do anything other than feed a pump that pumps it into the main tank. So I didn't mess with like splitting the lines to the engine or anything, so it's drawing off of both tanks. I just carry diesel around in this tank. When I'm running low in the main tank, I just flip a switch and a pump runs and puts fuel from this tank into the other tank. Come on inside. The first thing most people notice is that I redid all the dash and everything. That was partly because I just had a pretty clear image in my mind of how I wanted it to form up, but also because obviously there used to be a door here and stairs. And so there was no dashboard on this side of any kind. In these International Bluebirds, the instrument cluster stock is like way down by your knees and hard to see. So I wanted to bring that up and just make it more comfortable to, to drive and to sit in. These seats came out of Toyota Sienna's minivans out of a junkyard. And then I had to do some custom work on them to give them a second armrest. They only come with, you know, in a minivan, there's the armrest on the outside is a door. So I had to add a second armrest and that's how I made these captain's, captain's chairs. I put them all on swivels so that when there's four people in here, you can face together. And at some point I'll build a table that goes in between them. But even without the table, it's nice to sort of spend an evening in this as a seating area instead of just as a driver's and passenger's sort of cockpit area. So the overhead stuff is all electrical and systems devoted from pretty much this line forward. On this side, this is all my AC and DC 
distribution. This is my main DC panel, my main AC panel. The inverter's off, so it's all off. And then this panel up here is AC routing. There's three places that AC power can come from on board. There's the generator, the shore power hookup, and the inverter. And then there's three or four different places that AC power can be sent to. There's charging the batteries through the inverter charger, the AC panel as a second second place, and then there's a auxiliary AC split phase 240 outlet for like the welder and stuff. And so these this system up here basically lets me say like, great, I'm going to turn the generator on, so I want the main panel to run off generator phase one and the aux panel to run off generator phase two, or however I want to set that up. Most of the time it just stays put on main panel, inverter, and charger, sure, and then the aux is off. That's sort of the first place that electricity goes. The center area is all sort of like the smarts of the system. Um, my Victron color control is up here that's in charge of the whole Victron system in the bus. Then that's tied into a software system of my own design that runs on a ARM computer that's buried in here that powers the two touch screens. All the lights are run off of a bank of bistable relays. So these switches are just a switch up and a switch down for on and off. And then this same signal that these switches send can also be sent from like my phone or from the touch screens or whatever else just to tie everything together because I'm an integration nerd. This is the control panel for my generator. I have a Cummins Onan diesel generator on board, five kilowatts. And as I said before, I can use that to run the welder or charge my batteries or run the main AC panel or the other thing I can do with that auxiliary AC output is power someone else's shore power. So if I'm camping with someone else, I can kick the generator on and power both of us that way. These are my two afterburners for my two Chinese diesel heaters. The afterburner is like a aftermarket controller that replaces the little LCD screen controller that comes with your diesel heater. And those let me tie the diesel heaters in again to the same sort of integration system where I can you know, in the winter, if I'm not at the bus, but I'm gonna go to the bus an hour from now, I can turn the heaters on ahead of time before I get there, stuff like that. There's no lights in these, in, in this cabinet, but like in this cabinet, I have lights and there's a bunch of the guts of some of that system. A lot of that is yet to be hooked up, but a bunch of relays, outputs, and a bunch of uh, digital inputs for sensing what's going on. In here, there's, you can't really see it, but a bunch of integration. This is the, Interfaces for the light system, so that's controlling all the um, ons and offs for a bunch of for the that bistable relay bank I mentioned, and then over here I've got my like LTE modem and some other networking equipment, and behind the monitor is where the computer itself lives. This monitor and this monitor are just cloned; they're it's they show the same thing, and they both are a touchscreen. They both can be control, so if you know I can do stuff while I'm driving, or a passenger could do something, or whatever. This panel is just a bunch of ports for plugging in to all the stuff that's buried back there. So if I want to like plug in a cable to get on that network and like do some debugging or whatever. I've got ports for that. These aren't all labeled, but that's a USB port to get onto the Victron system. These are my battery cutoffs. So these are a Blue Sea Systems product where the battery safety cutoff is a solenoid remotely and you control it from here. So you can hear it go ka-chunk. Um, but that lets me safety cut off my batteries if I wanna like work on stuff. These are the switches for my two um, DC to DC charge controllers. I have two Victron Orion's TR Smart 12 to 12 DC to DC chargers to charge off the alternator. That gives me 720 watts total of alternator juice, oh, 60 amps total. But these are the remote switches for both of those. And then these are the breakers for my solar arrays. So the, I have two solar arrays because of the curve of the roof. I put them on two separate charge controllers. And this is the driver's side and this is the passenger side breakers to cut off the solar panels. So down here is the back end of my power system. Uh, I went all Victron, but yeah, just my inverter, uh, my two DC to DC charge controllers uh, that come off my engine system and my alternator. And then even further down, I have two solar charge controllers. And then I have just a couple little like auxiliary fuse boxes for hot power that doesn't go through the breakers and my Victron communication stuff. Uh, the other detail up here worth mentioning, in addition to getting rid of the door and rebuilding all that, was putting in these two skylights. Um, these are actually RV windows, like frameless RV windows. 
Um, and the way those are made, they just have an exterior panel of glass and no frame. Um, so it's really hard for water to creep under them. Um, so I made an aluminum like transition between the curved roof and a flat surface and then just put those frameless windows in there and they don't leak at all and it's great. And they open just a little bit this way for venting and stuff. And they just really add sort of both the natural light in here is great, but also the the presence that they have in terms of making it feel like you're in a some kind of spaceship or sci-fi movie set is uh, is pretty fun too. So then coming back from there, I sort of carried these armrest consoles back and down to give the passengers some armrest space and some storage. There's little compartments the whole way along. Um, one up here for the driver, cup holders and stuff. And then on this side, I've got my little sort of workspace for when I'm on my own. Just throw a laptop down here and it's a nice place to sit. These are all on swivels so I can bring it around the rest of the way. Under cabinet lights on the bottom of these. And I used the original lenses from the ceiling, you know, when it was a school bus. Um, so they have the Bluebird logo on them, which is kind of neat. Built these out of uh, aluminum. This cabinet goes back actually all the way to here. It's hard to see, but this, then there's a rib here that joins to the bus where that is, where the, the hat channel is. Under this Velcro panel is the wiring access to the roof. So from within this forward system, there's a bunch of wiring behind there, but then the wiring can jump from back there to this space hidden behind these boxes and either go further back in the bus or jump out and go to the roof for solar or antennas or whatever's up there. And then it's just hidden by this sort of Velcro patch. On this side, this is mostly parts and debugging stuff right now. My like laptop that I use to talk to all that stuff and configure it and like a bunch of spare and yet to be installed electrical stuff. The forward one has a bunch of just driver's junk in it, a pair of binoculars and some stuff that I just like to keep in the bus. And then the back one right now is like cleanup stuff. It's like paper towels and rags and trash bags and just stuff like that. So we made these window covers. I have seven of these that are all the same because I have seven bus windows left. And these are just a Velcro and snaps system that goes up and then they Velcro to each other. You know, if there was another window here, you can imagine there'd be Velcro and then it would snap and you'd put the next one up. So those give me the ability to black out all my windows. And then the other thing these window covers can do is fold backwards down inside themselves. So I can sort of, if I wanna have a half blackout situation or I wanna have one of these windows open, but still black out the bottom, they fold up like that. This is my little galley space, my fridge and things. A little bit of empty space left for when I go to add a sink. But for now, this is a nice little work surface. I've got these rubber tops that I made just to protect the countertop. Well, this is still sort of a work in progress. I made this slide out drawer for my ice co fridge. And that's just on like a big tray and drawer slides. And then it latches in place sort of a spring-loaded pull handle that latches like that. Pretty simple, but like fits in nice and like matches everything. It's right out there. I really wanted to keep the original school bus store just because I, I think that the school bus store is like a really cool part about a school bus. Um, and I didn't want to lose that. Um, I considered doing the um, single panel door mod where you bolt both halves of the door together and just treat it like a regular door. And then I ended up building the door system, the air system into my whole control integration mess. I've got a key fob like on, a, uh, on my keychain that I can use to open it. Um, and then that cylinder has sensors on it so I can tell if it's open or closed if I'm not at the bus. That's a lot of the, the gear that runs it is in there and some other GAC. There's some temperature sensors and stuff going on. But like I was saying before, it's really easy to get wiring back here. So there's, it's a, this little cabinet is made to hide the air, air cylinder that powers the door is hidden right here. And so this gave me a handy little spot to just shove a bunch of 
electronic scubbins that I wanted to keep out of the way. So this is the bed system. We'll call it a system. I wanted this to, as you can see, there's four seats up front. So this is designed to sleep for people. It's a bunk bed. This rack that the mattress sits on can be either here or it can go up these pins. There's pins on all the sort of legs and in the back corner, these pins can come out and it can pin back in up here. And this position is the like, everybody gets equal headroom position. And this is the, I'm on my own and I want all the headroom position. And then when it's like that, I just use this lower spaces storage. I've got, my, got a toolbox here now and like my one wheel and a kite and a backpack and some towels and all the things you know you need on an adventure. With this little partition and this little screen, you can sort of be in bed and feel like you're in a, your own private little space. Um, this partition is just Velcroed to the ceiling um, and it snaps onto, or excuse me, it Velcros onto the back of these storage pockets, which snap in place and it Velcros to the wall and tucks under the mattress. My mom and I sort of co-engineered these. They snap onto the columns of the bed and are just held there by, you know, tension like a sail or something on a sailboat. Um, and then, but then it's pockets on both sides and you can see I've got it all full up of stuff, just like all the things that take up space and make other storage areas messy can live here. Um, and then my other storage areas can stay free of screwdrivers and markers and padlocks and carabiners. And, you know, I keep the bug spray here cause that's a handy thing to have out. Um, one of the ones down here is just all batteries, all my batteries that I need for flashlights and stuff. I've got stuff sacks and bags and things like that. On the back side um, is like some toiletry stuff. I've got, like I keep a pajama shorts in there so that if I need to like jump out of bed in the middle of the night and I'm just in my johns or whatever, I can grab my pajama shorts and I'm not running around the campground in my underwear. And then when you go to raise this platform up, you can see the snaps end here and this last pocket just tucks under the mattress when you raise the mattress up. And then the bottom, the bottom set of pockets has an extra pocket just rolled up, hidden under there that can unroll to take up the space. So when you raise the mattress up, you still end up with the same amount of storage. I've also these some other window covers back here. The, the two window covers for that door and this door are magnets and they just pop on there. And then this one is the window cover for that window. And I just, it Velcros to the carpet on that wall around the window, but because there's Velcro on it, that means I can just store it on the ceiling um, where I Velcro all kinds of things. My mom and I made this cover. Well, really this particular piece, my mom fully made herself. So thanks, thanks mom. It's a big bag that zips closed over my bed so that, you know, if I toss a backpack on here or whatever, I'm not worried about getting the bed all messed up. I was having that problem where I'd come to the bus in the evening to like work on projects and toss stuff on the bed and then it would end up all messed up. And I was like, maybe I should just have a big bag. Um, and it turns out, yeah, I should just have a big bag and I recommend everybody have a big bag for your bed. It's great. It's a life-changing thing. I, you can see it's just like there's a pretty much fully made bed in here. Um, the top is waterproof. The top is, uh, you know, ripstop nylon. A lot of things on the bus are ripstop nylon, but then the bottom is just cotton. So the, the bottom breathes really well so that it's not totally just sealed up in a waterproof bag. Um, and then the bottom, the panel that the mattress rests on has a bunch of holes in it so that air can move here. This also just Velcros, it's like headboard storage thing. So this is like, I keep some power bank in here for charging my phone in bed and a flashlight and my keys to my other car are in there right now and you know, just whatever, some toiletries and stuff like that. Obviously I put my logo on everything. I don't really have a great backstory for the logo other than it felt like an important part of like, making the bus and other projects that I did before the bus feel to an outsider, like it looks way more cohesive. Like my bus with a logo on the outside of it is like, oh, that bus clearly exists for some kind of reason. And my bus with no logo on the outside of it is like, I should go inside and lock my doors. It's amazing how much of a perceptual difference like having sort of a cohesive thing with a insignia on it makes. I built this hatch 
obviously with my roof rack the way that it is outside, there's no, having hatches down the center line of the bus, they don't go anywhere except into a roof rack anymore. So I had to put the, uh, the hatch off to the side and I built this custom aluminum thing to accomplish that. Fabrication like this was a problem solving tool I used a lot in building the, a lot of the different parts of the bus. It was a very versatile way of working for building really weird shaped things. I've also got these drawers under the bed. This one is pretty shallow this way, but the reason it's shallow is because I have drawers on this side that are extremely deep. So these drawers go as far back as they can and then they only leave a little bit of dead space in the back corner under the bed. And that's where I keep road emergency stuff back there and stuff I'm like never gonna need. You caught me with my meticulously organized manuals and instructions for everything because that satisfies me a great deal. And then this is clothes and stuff. So that's a, there's like a surprising amount of storage under there, which helps to keep everything else organized. And then, the bottom bunk right now is just full of, you know, milk crates and camera bags. And I've got a milk crate of like my camp stove and my thermocell and you know, whatever else. So this is my overbuilt roof rack. It could be a roof deck, I suppose, but it's uh, mostly a rack. It's very, you know, utilitarian in construction. It wouldn't be comfortable to do yoga on or anything, but it's a great place to put a dozen kayaks or a bunch of mountain bikes or whatever else. Um, I've got my antennas up here. These are LTE antennas for the bus network. This is my GPS antenna for the GPS that's tied into my system up front. My two solar arrays. Um, each solar array is only 200 watts, so 400 watts total, which is not a ton, but it's just fine for me because really the most critical function of my solar is to keep all of the systems that need to run while the bus is unattended running without me having to worry about it or be on the grid or be tied into shore power. So this 400 watts is plenty to keep the batteries topped up and run all the uh, electronics of the bus when the bus is parked. The 599 on the roof is the original bus number. I painted it there because I wanted to sort of keep the, keep the legacy of the old bus number. Having the long skinny space down the middle lets me carry like really long lumber that wouldn't fit on the back or really long steel when I go to buy 24 foot sticks of steel. It's just a super useful, flexible um, element of the build. It's one of the key things that makes it a do anything bus for me anyways. Do all the things Gordo wants to do bus. Should I just get into it? Just start working and... Just start working. Cool. If you wanna prompt me to talk about anything in particular while I'm doing it, go ahead. And otherwise, I'll just sort of say things that come to mind. So the thing with these benches is that they're both the same, like footprint, let's call it. They have this, they're this 28 inch by 96 inch rectangular footprint. And that lets me build things that they stack with each other, things stack on top of them. That's also the pattern with which they lock into the bus. They have these feet and there's these receivers in the deck of the bus where they just pin on and then I don't have to worry about like strapping or chaining everything down. It just pins in and it's clean and nice. It's hard to remember which part is the middle when I grab the roof rack or the crane, I should say. One of my sort of design criteria for the crane when I was deciding that I wanted to build a way to move around all my tools and equipment without loading a million totes all uh, one at a time. One of the design criteria that I, that was important to me was that I'd be able to deal with it um, on my own, like set it up and take it down uh, by myself. Otherwise I'm just trading the ability to do it on my own for the convenience of having the crane. If I'm building a crane because I hate loading a bunch of individual boxes, at least loading the individual boxes I can do by myself. So the way the crane attaches to the bus is that it just hangs from these trusses overhead. Um, and the way that it does that is with these sort of big clamp brackets. I don't really, I don't really have a name for what they are because I've never had to describe them in detail to anyone before, but basically they um, 
reach up and around the roof rack and hang onto the truss like that. Um, and then all this extra stuff we'll see in a minute, but this stuff all has to do with how I pull it up there on my own. I've got this black rope with two carabiners on it that I toss over the rack like that. And then it clips on both sides. The crane boom is too heavy to lift from below and manage the hanging of it from below on my own, but lifting it from above is just easier. So anyways, I just lay my strap out roughly where I'm gonna get the crane up to. And then the clamps just, just like that. And then again on the other side, I don't always get it perfectly centered on the first try, but it's somewhat easy to sh shift around once it's up here. There we go. I have some marks on the deck of the bus that I look down at. I really should put some marks up here, but it's usually close enough. Um, and then I just put my strap across the top and tighten it down to keep those clamps from falling off. You know, you, you have a truck and you're the guy your friends know with a truck and suddenly you help everyone move. For me, I have a crane. Now I'm the guy my friends know with a crane. And it's funny, the kind of stuff you get asked to do when all of a sudden you've got a crane. That's one thing I, one thing I couldn't have really seen coming about this project. Toss that bad boy up there. When I was first designing this, I uh, really had it in mind that I would have an electric system for doing the lifting. And so I bought a couple of, or played with a couple of different winches that I thought would be a good choice and really what it came down to was electrical wiring to get enough power to the to the winch the wiring had to be pretty heavy duty and the winch has to move so then it's like a whole system of wires that have to move and everything else and uh I had a deadline because I was going on a trip, which is why I was inspired to build this thing in the first place, because I was going on a trip with all my gear, theoretically. I just said, well, I'll go with the manual chain hoist for now. And uh, I've never bothered to, never bothered to do anything else. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of work for like 45 seconds. I can put up with that. This is why I only need the crane to stick out this far from the bus. I really only ever need the crane to mount right here, and I only need it to stick out this far because this is pretty much all I ever do with it. I've got these two containers, and then I've got a couple of other ones that are like, I've got one that's basically just a big basket that I use to put loose stuff in or material or other boxes. But since they're all the same footprint, I only ever need it to stick out from the bus about this far. And uh, these swivel casters go on it just the same way that it was held on to the bus and the same way that they stack with each other. 
all the legs have a pinhole at the bottom. Pop that on there. See, it's not really a general purpose crane. It's not good for really anything that my friends wish I could do with it. When they say, hey, I know someone with a crane. It's not really useful except for this one thing. But for this one thing, boy, is it useful. Each of these containers weighs like roughly 1,200 pounds on its own, depending on what I've got loaded up in it, tools and stuff. So like, yeah, I could load all the cases that are on here by hand, but it's much easier to manage a 1,200 pound, you know, amount of stuff. And I'm sure there's people, as we speak, going to the comment section to say, holy smokes, Gordo, if those both weigh 1,200 pounds, that's over a ton you've got hanging out back here behind your tires, just like sticking way out like this. How can the bus handle that? And the fact is like, kids weigh a lot. Like these buses were built for really way, way a ton of weight, way more than this. But this bus was a 66 passenger bus, 66 kids or 44 adults. And it was 11 rows of seats. So that's six kids per row or four adults per row. And even if you don't, even if they didn't, you know, put any extra in there and you figure adults all weigh 150 pounds, that's still 600 pounds per row of people. And this was five rows. So that's 3,000 pounds right there. I'm not even touching that. Plus you gotta factor in what the seats used to weigh, what the walls used to weigh, what the floor used to weigh. This structure that I've built is way lighter than what used to be there, even though it's all steel. This tarp is another custom piece that uh, my mom and I designed and mostly my mom made. My mom is the sewing sensei of the family. I'm learning everything I can from her about these weird projects that I want to do. But there's still stuff where I'm like, hey, I don't trust myself to do this, mom. I need, I need seasoned hands. Uh, and this was one of those cases. So this is sort of like the core of the shop, let's say. Tools and materials. This bench top I made out of pallets from one of my local metal suppliers that I worked down and made this top out of for this workbench. You can even see, like in some of them, you can still see the nail holes there and there. Part of the reason I picked the specific width that I picked for these benches and for the footprint of the, like how exactly wide this was gonna be and everything else was, the footprint of um, of these Pelican 1650s. For the last like two and a half years, I've had an eBay listing alert set up for Pelican 1650s. And every time any, any of them would come up for a reasonable price that I could deal with, I have been slowly buying, buying these cases for this project. Um, just because they stack nice and they're the right size and they're waterproof. I don't have to worry about my tools getting all soaked out on the back of the bus. Um, I made these sort of like little luggage rack style things for them also. So when I pop a case out from the, let's we'll see, what one is this? Surprise, it's electrical tools. And uh, make sure I got that on there right. Yeah. So yeah, I've got these legs that I can 
put a pelican on and then it's sort of right up at working height and get the get in there and this is electrical stuff and we made these this was another sewing project with my mom and i's to make these uh inserts that go in the lids of a bunch of these cases for organization i've got like and this is the electric one so i've got like zip ties and uh, wire loom and stuff like that label maker this was another thing hot tip sortimo t box the sorting boxes these are the best sorting boxes you can get they're expensive but they're worth it in my opinion if you're serious about having a organized shop but also look at that fit Perfect fit in a Pelican 16, 1650, and two by two this way as well. So I've got other cases that are two by two Sortimos, and that's just a very satisfying combination in my opinion. So in addition to my tools and stuff, I've got um, some like hardware that I is useful for me to have for the types of projects I use. Stuck on the strap on this side. I'm in a rush. Viewer, if it looks like I'm struggling, it's because I'm in a rush because we're trying to make a video here. So it's really your fault when you think about it. Click away now. Uh, click away now and save me from this hell. So yeah, this is another one with a good insert in the top. I've got this, the top is pretty heavy. So I have these straps that hook onto the handle so that it doesn't uh, rest on its hinges all the time. But this is my little hardware store of all the like nuts and bolts I need to like typically use. I've got a second case of hardware stuff, but this one's more fun to look in. Uh, let's see, we've got small machine screws, big nuts and bolts, thread lock, smaller nuts and bolts, rigging hardware, shackles, ferrules, crimping tools for wire rope, stuff like that. And then in the lid, I've got my bolt cutters, I've got my ferrule wire rope crimping tools, a bunch of wire rope for rigging stuff. Uh, Got to stay organized. And gotta have your insignia on everything. This is, uh, this one is drills, drill bits, saw blades, my drill sharpener, tap and die set, sanding stuff, abrasives, bandsaw blades for my porta band, stuff like that. This is another labor of love of mine. This is where we were looking for a screwdriver earlier. This is where we would have come for that, oh my God. but it was all loaded up. So this, this, like, this was another sewing project where I was like, hey mom, please help me. I have an idea and not the skills to do it. Um, but I like took all the patches off of the cases that my screwdrivers had come in and then made one big case. I'm a real patch guy, love patches. This is another custom lid insert that I made that holds that stuff in place. And then these are also custom cases that I made. This one is, as you can see, my wrenches. Ooh, so this is foam that I routed on the sheet router at my local makerspace. Um, for wrenches, I've got, and these were clearly sized to fit in a Pelican. Oh, just so. But yeah, I got screwdrivers, some power tools, but not all of my power tools. Um, yeah. So that kind of thing times, times eight. This one is pretty much the same idea as that one. It's got a bench top on it, but this bench top on this one is a steel quarter inch steel plate. It's like a fixture table for welding. The compartment here at the end is these doors just come off and that's like all my welding stuff and my welder, welding helmet and gloves and fixtures and everything, clamps and 
you know, welding accessories, blowtorch, whatever else. I can lock this by putting a chain or whatever between these and it can't be opened, but most of the time I don't bother. And then in this side, you'd think I'd come up with something better than that little string, but this side is gas bottles for welding, one on each side, um, one that's a MIG mix and one that's for TIG welding, and then a couple more of these cases of fabrication tools. When I like portable band saws in there, I've got a bench grinder and a belt grinder and a few other like things that for my workflow are important fabrication tools and hearing protection and spare grinder wheels and stuff like that. Um, and then this on its own is like the portable welding setup. The other thing that we won't go into deeply, but secretly hidden up there, you can see these aluminum arms. I have a system of shop lights that I sort of built for this that go into these corner posts and like stick up and out so I can hang a shop light on there. So when I'm set up with the shop, like out in a driveway or somewhere where I'm not in a garage or indoors, I can have some light work at night or whatever else. So this is the other mode of the rear cargo space, which is to be a back porch or a deck or a covered cargo area. But we made this, uh, my mom and I again made this uh, canopy tent cover situation for that encloses the back space. And that just really gives the whole cargo area a second life as like a guest room or a screened in porch if you're parked at a camp spot or whatever else. And it makes this um, not as much of a, a waste of space during the times when I'm not trying to use it for cargo. Um, so it has these big screen windows that you can open. And then, you know, right now we're just seeing the cargo box that's immediately on the inside of it. But you can imagine if this was open inside, this would just make a nice screen room, essentially. And then there's a, another screen room, another screen window like this on the opposite side. And this whole back panel all the way up to the peak and down can zip just comes completely off and there's another panel that goes on there that's all screen. So when it's up like that, it's just this sort of big, beautiful screened in space. Um, it also has zippers here, uh, on one here and one here that go all the way up to the peak. And so if you zip these open, this one's caught on the Oh, cut this out, cut this out. Um, these open up and then this whole, basically the whole side can roll up and stow. And then you just have the roof basically. So if you want to just have a roof and fully open sides, you take the back panel off, you zip, unzip and roll these up. And then these little end flaps and this little bit here at the end, just keep it all tight and tensioned and nice, but you can have it essentially fully open. And then because of, <laughs> zip these closed again, but the way it's held up to the bus is on these cables that are tensioned across the top by all these um, little carabiner rings, just little snap rings that pop on and off of here. This whole thing goes up and down pretty easily. And because these are like a shower curtain, if you unhook it from that end, you can sort of scrunch it up. And if you needed to cover some cargo that was here, but didn't want it all out or whatever, you can scrunch it up and just set it to however far of extension you need it for any given thing, or put it away without actually putting it away by just pushing it all against the wall. So yet again, another, another thing that's like, got a million different ways I can use it, depending on what I'm trying to do. Really gives a different life to this back space, like in a, in a way that I'm so happy with. Like it, it started, the concept started as just a way to make the space more flexible and like, yeah, this won't be perfect, but it'll be better than nothing. And what it turned into is so above and beyond what I had hoped it would be. Um, it makes this like a, you know, positively 
delightful space. You can imagine being in a, a nice camp spot and having a screen room like this and enough room to set up a bunch of chairs and hang out is, uh, is really great. Yeah, I'm Gordo, Gordo from Earth. Thanks for watching. And uh, you, don't, you don't need to bust like this. You don't need any of this. Don't even bother. This was all kind of stupid. I built this, but like no one else really should.